Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 479th episode, we've got quite a sauropod, long neck dinosaur spectacular happening again. Heck yes, including one of the biggest sauropods ever described. I've got a big sauropod to talk about too. Is it because it's a sauropod? That's why it's so big? <laughs> no, it's it's one of the biggest Rabaki saurids. The ones related to Nigerosaurus. And then we also have an interview with Carrie Woodruff, who is a sauropod expert. It's all coming together now. Yep. Except I know your dinosaur of the day is about an ankylosaur. Well, I had to throw you a bone. <laughs> but then my fun fact will be about sauropods again. Oh, thanks. So <laughs> sort of switching it up a little bit, because even though we like to joke that I like the ankylosaurs and Sabrina likes the sauropods, we both like all the dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. Some more than others. <laughs> already getting back to it <laughs> <laughs> and that dinosaur of the day in case you're wondering is hungarosaurus it's a cool one mm -hmm. i remember seeing it at the i'm gonna mess up the name of the museum but hungarian museum of natural history yeah i think that's it hungarian natural history museum i cannot pronounce it in hungarian so yes. i'm giving the english version <laughs> <laughs> it's a cool museum mm -hmm. and a cool dinosaur but before we get into that dinosaur and the sauropods that we're going to talk about in this episode, we want to thank some of our patrons. And again, we have 10 new patrons. Amazing. Yes. All eligible for that patch, which will be going out very shortly after this episode comes out. Mm -hmm. And these new patrons are Matthew, Amaris, Philip, Southeastern Kaiju, Leipziger, Cynthia, Michael, Martha, Mrs. H and Mary Soralifus. Thank you so much for being a die know it all with us and welcome. Welcome all our new patrons. <laughs> We're so excited. Yeah, it's so cool. It's great to see it. such a good response to something that we enjoy doing. And like we always say, we couldn't do it without our patrons. So we really appreciate everybody who joins and helps us with our mission of spreading dinosaur joy around the world. Yes. And speaking of spreading dinosaur joy, we get into our news, our sauropod news. That is joyous news. <laughs> our first item was published in Historical Biology by Lucas Lerzo and others. I really like the title of this paper. It's The Last of the Oldies. <laughs> <laughs> An oldie but goodie. Yes. And I mean, all dinosaurs are old. In fact, it's dinosaur is sort of a synonym for old in just common English. But the reason they call it the last of the oldies is the new dinosaur is a diplodocoid. Diplodocoids are the large group of animals that include Dippy the Diplodocus, Dicreosaurids like Amargosaurus, and even Apatosaurus, plus Brontosaurus, if you consider that valid. And some people do. And if it is valid, it's a diplodocoid. But Diplodocus went extinct in the late Jurassic a little over 150 million years ago, and its closest relatives, the Diplodocids, a subset of Diplodocoids, were all gone by the early Cretaceous. But there was one group of Diplodocoids that made it all the way to the late Cretaceous, and that is the Rabakisaurids. Well done, Rabakisaurids. <laughs> yep, the last of the oldies. <laughs> So Rabakisaurids lived alongside titanosaurs in South America and Africa for millions of years until about 90 million years ago when they finally went extinct. So really, they only lasted about 10 million years of the late Cretaceous, but better than any of the other diplodocoids made it. Mm. After that point, even the Rabakisaurids disappear from the fossil record and the diplodocoid family tree ends forever. Oh. Womp womp. But Rabakisaurids still stand out as the last of the diplodocoids, which is pretty cool. And if you're having difficulty picturing what a Rabakisaurid is, I would say imagine Nigerosaurus. That's maybe the most famous with a sort of flat front mouth mm -hmm. with all the teeth lined up really closely, tons of teeth. I think they replace their teeth something like every two weeks. Very oh, wow. interesting animals. I always imagine them sort of like a lawnmower, mm -hmm. even though there wasn't grass at the time, but something just sort of plowing through all sorts of low vegetation. And the broad snout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks like a vacuum cleaner kind of. Very interesting animals. Not all the Rabakisaurids had that sort of mouth, but some of them did. So the new dinosaur is named Cydersaura. 
spelled S-I-D-E-R. And in Latin, usually you'd say that like cider. So that's what I'm going with. And the species name is Murray. I'm going to go through the name meaning backwards. So the species name Murray is, quote, dedicated to Ms. Murray Ripple in recognition of her work along the years as a preparator technician and later as director of the Museo Municipal Ernesto Bachman, which is a museum we talk about a fair amount because it's sort of in the middle of all the Patagonia stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Then the genus name, Cydersora, the Sora part, <laughs> still continuing backwards, is the feminine form of lizard, and that's to agree with the species being named after a woman. So a lot of times if the species name is after a woman, they'll do the genus also in a feminine form just to put them together, mm -hmm. especially since with dinosaurs, a lot of times there's only one species per genus, so it kind of makes sense to match them. But then the first part, cider, is Latin for star, which might seem a little strange because what do sauropods have in common with stars? They reach for the stars. <laughs> but this is a low browser. It's mm. reaching for the dirt. <laughs> well then. <laughs> so the reason is, quote, it's an allusion to the stellated shape of the middle to posterior hemal arches, end quote. So it has to do with the shape of a bone they found. Yes. So the neural arch on the top of the vertebra holds the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. If you've ever looked at a vertebra, there's the centrum on the bottom, and then above that, there's this big spiky thing. And in between that is where the spinal cord goes. But in dinosaurs, they also have a thing called a hemal arch, which is on the bottom of the vertebrae below the centrum, or in our back, it would poke in towards our organs, I guess. Mm. It's a good thing we don't have them. But the hemal arches don't hold a spinal cord. Instead, they hold blood vessels run mm. through the middle of it. And also the caudofemoralis tail slash leg muscle attaches to the outside of the hemal arch. And that's a really important muscle as it swings back and forth. It helps the dinosaur lift its legs. Mm -hmm. And it might be one of the reasons that dinosaurs were so successful out competing other animals is this big muscle that might have helped it move more quickly. Helped it balance. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good muscle. Mm -hmm. So you need the hemal arch there for it to attach to. The really cool thing, though, is when you look at the hemal arch of Cydersora from the front or back, it just looks like a normal arch. So it, it, there isn't really any shape to it. It just looks like a line that you draw in a loop around the bottom of the vertebra. Mm -hmm. But when you look at it from the side, it looks like a five-pointed star. Ooh. It's a really cool and definitely unique or mostly unique, because <laughs> it's been seen one time before, feature on Cydersora. So where was it seen before? It was found on what they think was a titanosaur. And the odds are good for the time and place because that was also from the late Cretaceous in South America. But it was not in the same formation. It was in the Candeleros formation, which is at least a few million years earlier. Hmm. So it's probably not from the same species. It's probably not going to get lumped together. But it might be from a close relative. Another star relative. Yeah, it's really cool. I'm glad that they pointed out calling it a star because the other way to describe it, which they did a couple times in the paper, is basically saying it has a pair of bumps, like one pair of bumps at the top and one pair of bumps at the bottom. Oh, that doesn't sound <laughs> quite as exciting. No, it's not exciting at all compared to star shaped. The other really cool thing about it is they got quite a few bones from a total of four individuals. Nice. It was actually found back in 2012 at the same time as the huge theropod Meraxes. Oh, but Meraxes got all the publicity at the time. Yes, and they dug them out at the same time. But as always seems to be the case, if you dig out a big new theropod and an herbivore mm -hmm. at the same time, <laughs> they always go for the theropod first. It did take a few years <laughs> yeah. for both of them, I guess. Yes, it did. But Meraxes came out, I think, about four years ago at this point. Has it been that long already? I think it was 2020. Hmm. My bad, it was 2022, so it's only been two years. That's pretty good, only a two-year gap between the two. Yeah, and I, I guess another reason you might start with the theropod in these situations is the sauropod bones are so big mm -hmm. that it takes a lot more time <laughs> to prepare through them. So I could see why they did that, especially with four individuals. That's a lot of rock and a lot of bone. Yes, and you got to be careful so you don't accidentally get rid of the, the star shapes. Yeah, that's yeah. true. End up with a four-pointed star, which isn't a star anymore. Mm. So the highlights from the holotype include the top of the skull. Very cool. Not often found for sauropods. Mm -hmm. 
They found some vertebrae, including 14 from the tail, a scapula, most of the lower legs, including a few foot, toe, and claw bones. And then, of course, they also found some paratypes or more individuals that were assigned to Cytosaura. That includes an older individual, which has more of the hips, the legs, and some hand bones. Then they've got another older individual's fibula, and they know that it's from a different one because those two that I've mentioned so far, they have all four of those fibulae. <laughs> oh, yeah. So if you have five of a specific leg bone. You, you... know that it's three individuals at yeah, least. Exactly. Because <laughs> unless it had an extra leg, it's not going to work out that way. That would be an interesting dinosaur. <laughs> it would be. And then the last individual that they have is just one centrum from part of a back vertebra. But the cool thing about it is that it's from a younger individual. And I guess they're probably just assigning it to Cytosaura because these were all found in a very close area within about 20 meters or 70 feet of each other. So they figure they're all from the same dinosaurs. It is a lot of bones, although they aren't all prepared out of the rock yet. Ooh, so there's more to learn. <laughs> there is. And it really made me wonder too, because with Meraxes found there too, and they even hinted at maybe there was some scavenging happening before they got buried and fossilized. Do they have some tooth marks on it from Meraxes? Mm, that would be super cool. That would be. And rare that you know exactly what left a tooth mark. Yes. Yeah. Because that's like we always say, like, you don't know what made a footprint unless it, the animal died at the end of the trackway. Mm -hmm. It's the same kind of thing with what makes tooth marks usually. But if they got fossilized together and the teeth match, it's a pretty good smoking gun. That's all speculation. But I'm just trying to read between lines of something that might happen. From their ankle bone, they found that Cytosaura has a crescent-shaped calcaneum. No, oh, so it's star and crescent-shaped bones. Yeah, I feel like they could have named Cytosaura after like the sun and the stars. Or the moon and the stars. Oh yeah, the moon and the stars, that's what I meant. <laughs> stars aren't crescent-shaped. But maybe they skipped that because it's the first Rabakisaurid calcaneum that's been found, so it might be really common. Mm. And then you've named it after a thing that's just in all the Rabaki swords. It's happened before. Yes. I think it might be safe to say that they don't all have star-shaped hemal arches, though, because they have found those before. Mm -hmm. And it's just such an unusual thing to have going on. Cytosaura was found in the Nuquen province of Argentina near Villa El Chocón. And there have been a lot of dinosaurs found in that area, like we already mentioned, Meraxes. But New Camp Province is just a great place to find dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. All the bones were found in the Huincul Formation, which is Upper Cenomanian to Turonian. In plain English, it's between 96 to 93 million years old, based on the current estimates of that formation. So it's right near the very end of the Rabaki swords, since we think they probably went away about 90 million years ago. We think its closest relatives are Zapalsaurus and Etapoyasaurus. And Zapalsaurus lived in the early Cretaceous, about 30 million years before Cytosaura. Hmm. So it's one of those that qualifies as quote unquote basal, mm -hmm. meaning that it's more similar to these earlier ancestors than it is to its contemporary family members. Cytosaurus is more basal? Yes. Cytosaura also may be the largest known Rabakisaurid, estimated at about 15 tons and 18 to 20 meters or 59 to 65 feet long. That is big, although not as big as the sauropod <laughs> I'm going to talk about. I'm sure it's not. Because <laughs> it's big for a Rabakisaurid, but that's a pretty big asterisk since Rabakisaurids are actually known for being kind of small. Mm -hmm. Its femur is about 1.55 meters or 5.09 feet long or about as tall as a Sabrina. Oh. <laughs> For comparison. I'm taller, but okay. Are you? Yeah. Yes, you are one inch taller. Thanks for broadcasting my height. <laughs> Towering over this femur. <laughs> <laughs> For comparison, Nigerosaurus is 1.08 meters or 3.54 feet, while a more distant relative, Apatosaurus, is 1.79 meters or 5.87 feet. And in case you're wondering, the next biggest Rabakisaurid is probably Lamaesaurus at 1.44 meters or 4.72 feet. So it's about a quarter foot or a little over a 10 centimeters taller than the next biggest Rabakisaurid. 
which is pretty significant. Hmm. I went into all that detail because I know a lot of people really like to know what the biggest dinosaurs are. So I figured just lay it all out there. All right. <laughs> but still smaller than an apatosaurus. The part of the skull that they have is also more robust than its closer relatives. And in addition to that, Cytosaura has some other weird features. The weirdest may be that it has a hole in the roof of its skull. Hmm. It's not quite like Brachiosaurus. It's more like what you see in Decreosaurids, like a Margosaurus. I had to look this up because I never even realized that a Margosaurus has a hole in its head. In <laughs> Cytosaura, it's not a large hole. It looks like it's under one centimeter in diameter, just a fraction of an inch. So it's a pretty small hole. Don't really know what it's for. Maybe making the bone lighter. Hmm. Who knows? It also has some features that are used to define what makes a titanosaur a titanosaur, which is strange because it's not a titanosaur. So why does it have these prototypical titanosaur features but in case you're wondering those features are it's got a part of the neck vertebrae that surrounds the spinal cord that neural canal mm -hmm. it's farther forward in the vertebrae than it is on other sauropods and there's also a hollow spot running down the middle of the bottom of the vertebrae so these are all titanosaur features yeah those are both titanosaur features and then it's got the other feature that you see in dicreosaurids I was going to say it's useful because I've actually got two titanosaurs to talk about. So keep that in mind. Yeah. When you, that small gap or that small groove <laughs> <laughs> or hollow in the vertebrae. <laughs> Since we don't have the front of the head or the jaws, unfortunately, we don't know if it had the same interesting flat fronted mouth like Nigerosaurus. Oh. Yeah, it's a bummer. At least not yet. They haven't prepared all the bones yet. Yeah. But I mean, they did the skull, list out yeah. what the bones were. I guess there could be something in the matrix with it, but I don't know. Seems unlikely. Uh, here's hoping. Yeah. I mean, they already found four, so there's a decent chance that there are more individuals out there mm -hmm. for them to find. And then for its close relatives, the Polosaurus and Etopwesaurus, we don't have their mouths either, mm. as far as I know. So we really don't know what its whole head looked like, which is unfortunate because every time there's a new dinosaur, you want to know what its face looked like. Mm -hmm. At least it got the top of the head. <laughs> yeah, with a little weird hole in it. But again, since it is more basal farther up the family tree than other Rabaki swords from that time, again, the last of the oldies, mm -hmm. <laughs> as they called it, it might have had a mouth more like the early or Diplodocoids. So it might have had a mouth more like Diplodocus, basically, mm -hmm. or Apatosaurus or something. Slimmer. Yeah, and like the peg teeth rather than the big battery of chisely teeth all packed together. But we don't know. Need more fossils. It's always the case. Our favorite hashtag. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of them. And in just a moment, we'll get into some more sauropod news, some titanosaurs. But first, let's pause for a quick sponsor break. Well, as promised, there are two new titanosaurs to talk about. In this sauropodtastic episode, and Garrett, you already gave some nitty gritty details on what titanosaurs are, but I'll just say real quick, they were a group of sauropods that lived till the end of the Cretaceous, and they've been found on all seven continents, and if you think about titanosaurs, you think usually about the big ones like Patagotitan or Argentinosaurus. It's funny you mention Argentinosaurus because Cytosaura is from the same formation as Argentinosaurus. All right. So it wasn't even the biggest <laughs> sauropod <laughs> in its formation, despite being the biggest known Rabaki I mean, It's hard to beat Argentinosaurus. Yeah, it's a pretty cool one. This new one doesn't beat Argentinosaurus either, but it's called Gandititan cavocatitus, and this was published in the Journal of Systematic Paleontology by Feng Lu Han and others. It's a pretty good size, I will say. I guess the Rabaki sword you were just talking about was maybe a little bit longer. This one is estimated to be about 50 feet or 14 meters long. And its neck is estimated to be 15.4 feet or 4.7 meters long. So a good size neck. And the neck bones that have been found, the cervical vertebrae, are elongated. That's why they think the neck is pretty long. Mm. The skull is about 13 and a half inches or 34 and a half centimeters long. Oh, they got a skull mm -hmm. and a neck. Yeah. Well, most of a neck. They have found six articulated neck bones, two partial backbones, a complete sacrum, 17 tailbones, and part of the right pelvis. Not bad. Yeah. 
It lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Ganzhou City in Ganshan County in China. It was found in the Zhou Tian Formation. They know it's a new species based on details in the vertebrae. It's got these depressions in the fossils, as well as some slits and other patterns. It also had some tall neural spines that were bifurcated. Those are the spines on the neck. And this individual, they think, was probably a subadult or adult. That's based on the lack of sutures on some of the bones. So they're not fused together yet. Mm-hmm. Still growing. Yes. Well. Probably. No, because they think it's probably a subadult or adult. Interesting. So I guess they don't always fuse then. They specifically say, quote, no trace of neurocentral sutures is visible, suggesting that this specimen was a subadult or adult at the time of death. Not a senescent adult, I guess, mm. <laughs> as the, the terminology for a really older individual. It was found in a dark red sandstone layer in June of 2021, and they found Gondotitan to be a sister taxon to Obdurainerus, which is a titanosaur that was found in Mongolia, and only know that one, though, from parts of the tail. So Gondotitan helps show sauropod evolution in the late Cretaceous of Asia. The holotypes now at the Jiangxi Geological Museum. The genus name, Gondotitan, means geological work in Ganju City, and the Gan refers to Ganju City, and the D means earth. It's also the first syllable of dish, which means geology. In Chinese. The authors wrote, quote, We also note the incidental similarity between the first syllable of Ganda Titan and the Old Norse word Gander, referring to magic or magical spirit, which is perhaps appropriate given the immense size and fantastical appearance of Titanosaurian sauropod dinosaurs. End quote. Nice. Yes. And then the species name, Cavocatitus, means cavity tailed, and it refers to the complicated pattern seen in the tail bones. Good on them for recognizing the old Norse connection. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a commonly spoken language. Sounds like a cool dinosaur, though. It is. Titanosaurs in general. Fantastical appearances. <laughs> Even though it is a little small. Well, so the other titanosaur that I'm going to talk about is ginormous. <laughs> is that the technical term for it? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's my term for it. <laughs> <laughs> this titanosaur is called Bustingori Titan Shiva. It was published about in Acta Paleontologica Polonica by Maria Simone and Leonardo Salgado. And as they put it, it's, quote, one of the largest sauropods ever recorded, end quote. Hey, hey. Mm-hmm. They estimated its body mass based on the femur, and their estimate was that this sauropod, this titanosaur, weighed 67.3 metric tons, or 74 tons. <laughs> it's frustrating, because usually we just go with tons, mm -hmm. because if it's a couple tons, like the difference between metric and the American systems are easy, mm -hmm. because they're, they're basically the same. But once you get into these like almost 100 tons, they start to split apart, yeah. and you got to say both types of tons. When you're talking about ginormous <laughs> dinosaurs. Yeah. <laughs> I will say, though, there is some controversy in estimating the weight of huge sauropods by femur circumference mm -hmm. because it's sometimes, according to some people, might overestimate by quite a bit. So sometimes they like to do stuff like convex hulls and other analyses to get lower estimates. And you do see that with these dinosaurs. A lot of times they start out crazy weights, and then when people look more detailed at it, they shrink a little bit. They shrink a little bit, but not so much that they're not still ginormous dinosaurs oh, yeah. it's still going to be many tens of tons mm -hmm. <laughs> which is maybe not 70 well the author said quote the record of this new sauropod corroborates the idea that gigantism evolution of forms over the 50 metric tons would have evolved many times within u titanosauria there's five titanosaurs found that weighed over 50 metric tons patagotitan argentinosaurus Notocolossus, Puertosaurus, and Dreadnoughtus. Four of them have been found in Patagonia, and this new one is also from Patagonia. <laughs> <laughs> Something about Patagonia. So now it's five out of six? Mm hmm. I'm trying to figure out which one isn't. Is it Notocolossus? So, yes, but it was found very close to Patagonia. <laughs> Still in Argentina? Mm hmm. <laughs> That's pretty funny. So, this new one. 
Agustin Gori Titan, lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now New Kin Province, Argentina, found in the same formation that your Rabakisaurid was found in. Mm-hmm. It was outnumbered for sure. Mm-hmm. They found four specimens. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah. A relatively complete skeleton and then three incomplete ones. Like Gandhi Titan, it also had depressions and other details in the vertebrae fossils, including on the arms and legs. The holotype that they found of Bustangori Titan includes the right jaw, tooth fragment, vertebrae, parts of the shoulder, parts of the arms, part of the pelvis, part of the feet, parts of the legs, and more. The jaw has at least 12 tooth sockets with 10 in-situ teeth, and it had cone chisel-like teeth, but the teeth aren't well-preserved, so it's hard to know for sure. Its neural spine was not divided and not too tall. It did have a slender humerus arm bone, and they found five metacarpals foot bones from the right foot that were preserved, and those are slender. The authors found this titanosaur to be a derived lithostrotitan, which is a sister group of saltosauridae. That's a clade of titanosaur. Saltosaurs are the best. They're the ones that have a little osteoderm sometimes. As, yeah, I was going to say sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not in that group. It's close to it. A lot of lithostradians have been found with osteoderms, but that's not one of the features of the group. Oh, cool. Add them to my list of sauropods I like a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so the genus name, Bustingori Titan, is in honor of Manuel Bustingori, who owns the land where the fossils were found and supported the excavations. And the species name Shiva refers to, quote, supreme deity of Shivaism, branch of Hinduism, who destroys and transforms the universe in allusion to the faunal turnover that occurred in the middle of the Cretaceous period towards the Cenomanian slash Tyronean boundary, end quote. Yep, one of the many extinction events. Mm -hmm. <laughs> one of the smaller ones, but still an extinction event that dinosaurs had to deal with. So yeah, those are the three new sauropods for the week. Some big news, pun intended. <laughs> with big sauropods. Mm -hmm. I like that this one had a jaw with teeth. Yeah, although it sounds like the teeth weren't well preserved, so we don't know too much about them. Other than that they're chisel-like. I always think of Camarasaurus when I think of chisel-like teeth. They're like big teeth in sauropods. That's the one that always comes to mind for me. Mm -hmm. Definitely eating something very different than the Rabakisaurid Cidersaura was in the same formation. Yeah. Well, that's probably how they're able to live alongside each other. Mm -hmm. And we'll be talking to Carrie Woodruff, sauropod expert, in just a moment. But first, a quick break for our sponsors. And now on to our interview with Carrie Woodruff. This was a fun on-site interview that we did in Miami mm -hmm. at his new museum. He's only been there for... About a year. Yeah. And he's already finding them new dinosaurs, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it's a cool museum, too. But before we get into it, just a quick reminder that we have an extended version of this interview for our patrons. So if you are a patron, you might want to check that out, too. We're joined this week by Carrie Woodruff, who is the Curator of Vertebrate Paleontology at the Philip and Patricia Frost Museum of Science in Miami. We're actually in Miami he just gave us a tour of the museum. So thank you very much for joining us and for the tour. Oh, thank, uh, my pleasure. Glad to have you all here finally. And we are actually doing it in what will be our brand new paleontology exhibit yeah. and what will be my office. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, we're technically in his office. If you saw us, though, you wouldn't know because there aren't any walls around the office yet. There are ideas of walls. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. There's some studs. <laughs> And there's a painting of a mammoth on the wall and a before and after sign, which is pretty funny. Ah, but it's cool because I'm excited to, well, it'll probably be a while till we can visit again, but we see pictures of the space when it's up and running. Exactly. You can be like, I was there mm -hmm. when it was a construction zone. We should take a picture so that we can prove it. Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us what's it been like being curator of vertebrate paleontology here? Uh, it's been fun, you know. Miami is known for many things. Dinosaurs are not one of them. So whenever I tell people, you know, I'm at a museum in Miami, they, I get a lot of weird looks. <laughs> um, but it's been fun. A big thing I've been doing is just developing this new program. So the museum has never had any paleontology program before. So everything we're doing is from the ground up. So that's been fun. It's been daunting. And I was gone for five months doing field work this year around the globe, which was awesome. But yeah, it's really kind of this punctuated period of time. You know, I basically have 
half of the year I actually, you know, work on developing the program from here at the museum side of it. And then the other half is, you know, doing it through field work and other international collaborations and research. You got to fill the museum with something. Yes. <laughs> so you just mentioned the field work. Is there anything you can share from what you found out in the world? Yeah. So I started the field season in late April with an expedition led by the Natural History Museum of London, so, uh, led by uh, Dr. Uh, Susanna Maidman. We were actually in Morocco doing some really cool work in the Middle Jurassic, which there will be a lot of cool stuff on that. Then I spent the bulk of the summer in Montana working in the Dinosaur Park Formation. So we got some cool stuff. I love it. Everyone gave me crap. I collected a 16-foot long petrified tree. All of my other paleo friends were like, why in God's name would you collect a tree? Because <laughs> like, it's cool and it's big. And my dog Hunter found it, so I loved it. Nice. <laughs> And then we got uh, parts of ceratopsian skulls there. We actually, I can tell you this, this is neat. We found, thanks to Dr. Michael Ryan, who identified it, the tip of the very first Styracosaurus oh. from the US. So that's really exciting. Cool. So yeah, tip of a horn. So that'll be really neat. Um, but, you know, we're like 20 miles from the Canadian border. So, but, you know, we take whatever, whatever <laughs> yeah. victory we can get. It is funny on that border between Alberta and Montana, especially how it's like first Canadian, first American. Yeah. It's like they're <laughs> 10 found what, 25 miles that way. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, but yeah, doing cool work there. Bits and pieces of other things. We have a partial mummy hadrosaur that we'll go get next year. And then Mongolia, that was awesome. That was my first time going. And that's the most magical place on earth. Like oh. it should steal that slogan from Disney. Like I, <laughs> I give it to Mongolia. And we were actually digging up the body of Nemectosaurus, which is really cool because Nemectosaurus, one of the most famous Mongolian dinosaurs, it was just known from a skull that the Polish expedition collected. And then uh, Phil Curry and all of his amazing sleuthing work, like looking at old photos and finding old sites. He basically, they pinpointed the site in 2016 and there was the post crania sticking out of the rock wall. <laughs> so... It's been a really important uh, linchpin sauropod for especially like titanosaur and Asian sauropod taxonomy. So we were doing all that really fun work, digging it up. We also found kind of one, the last day Phil decided he'd showed me the holotype site of, um, uh, of Prenocephaly, excuse me, the Pachycephalosaur, mm. really famous skull, you know, pictures of it. You've seen it. Like they just pick it up in like a sand and shake it off and walk away. Amazing. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> and we're going there and uh, um, uh, another paleontologist, another Phil as well, Phil Bell, just kind of staring down there by his feet and he says, oh, what's that? And it was the dentary, and actually the whole the whole right lower jaw from the holotype skull that the poles had never discovered or collected. Oh wow! wow. So that yeah. is so cool. Yeah, I like too that you found not a Nemectosaurus body, but the, the Nemectosaurus, yeah. Nemectosaurus body. <laughs> yeah, so it's really cool. So there's been in the very nerdy minutia that is like sauropod taxonomy. There's been this big going debate because like 25 miles away. There was another sauropod that the same expedition found called Epithecelacaudia. Mm -hmm. And that was a body, but no neck or head. Mm. And of course, there's been this big debate. Obviously, they're not the same animal, right? But like, are Epithecelacaudia and Nemectosaurus the same taxon or not? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we don't, no one knew because we didn't have any overlapping material. Now we do. <laughs> so we'll actually be able to examine that and test that hypothesis. That's great. That is. So when everything's ready here, do you have any fossils ready to start preparing? Yeah, so the very first fossil we'll prepare is actually the very first fossil I collected for the museum. So when the museum hired me on last year, they basically were like, oh, awesome, welcome to the team. Hey, can you get us a dinosaur? I was like, <laughs> uh, sure. So I was in Montana because I used to work at the Great Plains Dinosaur Museum. I knew a bunch of landowners out there, and I was like, hey, can I look for some dinosaurs? And I actually knew this one ranch that had basically a complete and articulated tail from a hadrosaur called Brachylophosaurus. I was like, hey, can I get that? <laughs> and they were like, and I'd seen it for years. I knew about it for years. And it was like it, just in this, this one hillside that was like the worst hillside to get to. And they didn't really feel comfortable with like a big crew of people because, you know, hillside people fall, slip. And they were like, they were really nice. And they were like, well, if you can figure out a way to get it out the ground where you don't have to have people doing it, you can have it for the museum. And I knew a guy who had horses and I was like, I took him there and he's like, hey, you think we can pull it out with your horses? And he was like, oh yeah. So we <laughs> went to the ranchers. They were like, well, there you go. So we drug it out with horses, which was cool because, you know, that's like the old school way yeah. you know, that they used to do it. And I, I love doing it. So that'll be the first fossil we clean here in the lab. Also, what's great is we're going to start by hiring one preparator. So when the exhibit opens, we'll have a preparator who will basically be like running the lab, everything. Then 
within this first year of the exhibit opened, we'll hire a second preparator because mm -hmm. we don't want a big massive backlog. I mean, mm -hmm. at that point, we'll have three summers under our belt of collecting. So we, mm -hmm. I mean, we already have a good amount of material. So we want to actually be able to get through this material we're collecting. So you, I assume you're sourcing your preparators from, do you already have your first preparator? Are they going to have to move to Miami because there isn't a ton of fossils being prepared in Miami? Yeah. So we're actually, we are in the final stretches of interviews for our preparators uh, now, which would be really cool. Um, and what's amazing is I th think we've had, it. it's kind of weird, like the, it's an inverse from other positions I've heard about before. It's like the bulk of the candidates are international. Oh, and interesting. Which is awesome. And I mean, I'm not talking about just like people who are from other countries. They are like active preparators in other countries, hmm. which is really cool. Um, yeah. And kind of fits because that whole like, you know, oh, Miami's like this big international hotspot. And so it's like, you know, that's a great thing too with the program that we're building here is we don't have anything in our backyard. It's not like Museum of the Rockies or the Utah Museum of Natural History or the Denver Museum of Natural History where you can just find something in your backyard, so to speak, mm -hmm. and your display showcase that. I mean, the Florida landmass didn't even exist during the Mesozoic. So I couldn't find a Florida dinosaur if my life depended on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and Miami being this big international hub, we have to, you know, Miami is international anyway. So therefore the dinosaurs in our program should be international. And that's really cool then because the people we have building this program are international too. Mm. Mm. I like that that way of looking at it because yeah, when you think of dinosaur science, Florida is not the place <laughs> that comes to mind. But it's cool to talk about because there are lots of, like you said, international things here. There's so much cultural mixing going on mm -hmm. that you can do the same thing with dinosaurs from around the world. That's such an awesome idea. Yeah, and I mean, I was amazed learning about it. I mean, I knew you know Greg Erickson, you know, is up at the northern part of the state, and then there's of course the Florida Museum of Natural History, which is and absolutely, it is like the most amazing museum research center I've ever seen. There's some like 30 curators there and like 90 grad students. It's like it's, wow. it's an army. And they do paleo because there's John Block and stuff there, but they don't do dino paleo. And there's no paleo history museum of any kind in Southern Florida. So we really want to become that, that institution for our whole region of the state. Mm -hmm. Nice. That's great. So what do you have, Because because this space is going to be kind of half prep lab that visitors will be able to see the work in action, and then also a really cool exhibit, but what, what's going to be on display first? So the museum hired an exhibit design company to do the exhibit. And so the, we, you know, I basically consult and work with them on it. And in essence, the exhibit component will basically be the process of paleontology. So half of it will be like, what is a fossil? How do we find fossils? You know, how do we dig them up? And then you'll basically walk along that half of the exhibit, if you will. Then you'll see the prep lab, right? Because everything up to that point was how do we get to the objects that are in the lab? And our lab is a big fish tank, right? It's glass sided. You'll be able to see the preparators at work. And then you transition to the other half of the exhibition, which is actually the science. So how do we actually study these fossils? which I think is really kind of cool. And, you know, again, a lot of the research that we're putting in is like we have a cast of the Tufts Loves T-Rex going in. And even though there hasn't been a paper yet on it, get on it, Thomas Carr, um, <laughs> you know, the fact that they are newer specimens or what's really cool, we have a cast of Parasaurolophus, uh, you know, of course, the famous ROM holotype specimen uh, here, but we actually have an exhibit. There's a great master student, Michael Michael's going to kill me for forget, forgetting the pronunciation of his last name. But he did this really amazing science communication where he looked at the nasal turbinates and the whole nasal passages. And basically, he calls it the hadrophone. Mm -hmm. So it's this instrument and of, mimics what these low frequency sounds would have been like. And so we actually, we got the clips from Michael. We actually talk about his research. We'll actually say his last name correctly in it. And you'll actually be able to like press a button and you'll actually be able to hear it. So, which I think there's a lot of cool things like tying yeah. in. And really one of those emphasis, again, like Florida being this hip, especially Miami, like this hip, new, fancy place. It's like, what are new things we're learning about old stuff? Yeah, definitely. And I like how you have, yeah, when you pull in different ways, like being able to hear something and and putting that along with like the science of what we know. Yeah. Um, yeah, bringing it all together. Yeah, and also being able to feel the stuff. Like we were just down looking at the one large non-avian dinosaur that you currently have in the museum, the Euteranus, fully fleshed and feathered out. And there's also a little bronze of it, which is really cool. Yeah. And also 
we should mention that the Uteranus is snapping at a Confucius Ornus. Three flying. Confucius Ornus okay. flying. A little flock of Confucius Ornus. It doesn't care which one it gets. <laughs> it's a really fun display. Yeah. So let's see. You've got a backlog of fossils. It sounds like there's a lot of stuff that's just ready to go, which is good that the space is opening up so soon. It's January 26th, which this episode may air just before or just after. But <laughs> Yeah, and we're hoping... January 26th is like our, dare I say, our working date. Okay, you know? yeah. So that's a rough approximation. So you might be hearing this and you're like, what did that? It's like February 1st and it hasn't opened yet. I don't know. But that's what we're shooting for. <laughs> is this where the Nemectosaurus body is coming? So that is a great question. One of the things I have put forward to the museum, and they've been incredibly receptive, is again, this whole idea of that, like Miami, this big international city, Again, we should. If Miami is such a worldly city, let's showcase dinosaurs from the world. And what's amazing is all of these countries that I've been so fortunate to go and visit. And again, we work with amazing scientists in all of these countries. But it's also, in a way, like when you work in Mongolia right now. And again, Mongolia has, I think, the best fossil laws in the world. You know, and recognizing part of their cultural heritage and identity. And so all of these museums come and they collect fossils every summer and they just hand the jackets over to the Institute and they go, yep, here you go. Bye. Mm -hmm. And the Institute is amazing, but they don't have a giant infrastructure. They don't have giant labs. They don't have huge staffers. They don't have 90 preparators. <laughs> no. So what we're looking at doing, and if there are any potential donors listening, you help us out, is we've already talked to the Institute. They're very receptive. Our museum's very receptive about it. But Basically, in token, you know, in kindness of these museums letting us come and do work with them together in this research, can we bring the fossils back over here and prepare them and then send them back and they're ready to go, ready mm -hmm. to be displayed, ready to be researched? So that's what I hope we will do with the body of Nemectosaurus. Yeah, that would be amazing. Mm -hmm. And also, I mean, it's not, I guess it is kind of far away, but in Orlando, that's what they did with Sue, right? They got a chunk of Sue down. They prepared it at Disney World. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it went back and went on display somewhere else. But it's great if you have a lot of people around. It's nice to be able to see the fossil preparation in action. And sauropods are some of the coolest things to see prepared because it's not somebody looking through a microscope or through, you know, like a magnifying glass that's illuminated and you're trying to see over their shoulder what they're preparing on. On a sauropod, you could see it all the way across the room, tell what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of, I'll say, added benefits because like we looked at it and for instance, if we are able to get fossils, for example, from Mongolia over here to prepare um, for a loan to do that, there hasn't been a museum in the United States where guests could see fossils from Mongolia being prepared mm. and studied. You know, of course, you can go to AMH and h and see those like classic Chapman specimens, right? But they're done hung up on the wall. But understanding that process of preparation and study and everything, like, you know, the public doesn't know anything about that because they've never been able to see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so again, if we can do that, hopefully not just in Mongolia, hopefully in all of the institutions and all of the countries that we're able to work with, that would be awesome. Yeah. So the first one's going to be the tail of the Brachylophosaurus. Yep. That's what'll be here. Brachylophosaurus. Then we have part of a Ceratopsian skull I collected this summer. And then, then we'll bring in the big petrified tree. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is that going to fit in here? Yes. Well, I took it out. I systematically broke it into eight foot halves. Okay. <laughs> just so I could know it would fit. <laughs> that's good. That How much did that weigh? Um, I need to get it. Actually, that's on my shopping list as an actual scale because years ago we developed these. They're basically like tripods that you use for lifting heavy stuff. So we could basically attach a big fish scale in essence, right? And weigh a jacket. And I had the lighter half. That was pretty good. The chain hoist worked. But the second one, getting it into the cart, the chain hoist actually failed. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. It didn't like drop it or anything. It just like it wouldn't lift up. And that was a one ton chain hoist. So <laughs> I knew that that jacket was at least one ton. Probably multiple tons because the rating on the chain hoist is <laughs> conservative usually. Yeah, it's usually under. So I mean, just I've been saying superficially that, you know, oh, we have a 16 foot long petrified tree that weighs 5,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. We'll do an official weigh in. How about that? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> but I knew it was going to be heavy. So like I, there is not a piece of rock on it. I field prep the entire thing. Just wow. to produce the weight. Because for the first six weeks of the summer and excavating it and getting the first part, I was on my own. Mm. <laughs> like it was me and the dog. That was it. <laughs> Working was on it. the tree. <laughs> yeah. But it was it was funny, actually. Um, 
the Badlands Dinosaur Museum, uh, which is in Dickinson, North Dakota, so Denver and Liz uh, Fowler, and Friedman Fowler, I should say for Liz, they were actually, was wonderful as we went to college together, we shared an office. They were digging on the BLM just across the way. <laughs> so whenever I needed something, I would like just honk the horn or holler or something <laughs> like that. So all the videos of us flipping the tree, even being able to flip those parts, it was thanks to the Dickinson crew for doing it. So Nice. nice. So yeah. <laughs> 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 the last time we talked to you, we talked about Dolly, the sauropod, the sick sauropod. Do you have any research in the works that you're allowed to share? Yes, actually. And I'm, I'm, this is no joke. Like right before I came down to meet you guys today, I was in the process of uploading the Dolly monograph because Dolly is a new genus oh. sauropod. So we'll find out the name later. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there is. Some great artwork in the Dolly paper. Nice. <laughs> Not done by me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep an eye out then. Yes. So yes, the Dolly one, that'll be good to get all, get out because I've been working on that for far too long. So it was a dinosaur that keeps giving. Mm -hmm. You know, we had the respiratory infection. Now it's this new genus from the Morrison, which is really cool. So yeah, it'll be a fun one. And then, yeah, just trying to get out. I have some papers on theropods. I know I just have to take a shower after every time I do that. <laughs> A bunch of new pachycephalosaur stuff in the pipes, so. Nice. But it's too early to say anything about them. It is. I mean, I did just two, three weeks ago, I had uh, two new species of pachycephalosaurs come out. We so. talked about that. Oh, yeah. Yes. I don't remember their names. It was, ooh, I'm blanking on how to pronounce it. I remember it was it. based on their like. Sphera. Spherotholus. Spherotholus. So Spherotholus, the two species are Spherotholus lion's eye and Spherotholus triregnum. Yes. Hey, you got the names right. Yeah. Uh, we were uh, <laughs> we're getting towards the end of the year, so I was trying to make sure we're covering all the new dinosaurs of the year, and we that was part of an episode with, we talked about seven. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, 2023 was weird because there was almost nothing for the first few months, and then at the end, it was just a whole ton of new dinosaurs. It was the year of mosasaurs. That's what it'll be. Yeah. Year of mosasaurs. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, and we should hopefully have Dolly next year, we have actually, I can sneak, I can sort of say this sneakily, we have the first pachycephalosaur from the two medicine formation. Ooh. Oh, cool. So we'll hopefully get that one submitted next year and maybe we'll find something during the summer that's new. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> and there's something top secret that we know about, but can't say anything about, <laughs> but I'm very excited. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all the hints we can give. Yep. <laughs> But at the patron level, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it sounds like you're really getting the program here going in a major way. One of the things I'm really actually really excited about is a lot of the different programs we'll be doing here. So we're not doing anything new here, right? There are all these amazing museums that have prep labs. You can, you know, see the preparation in action. Museums that have field programs, right? It's just, it's a proven track record for success. So we just, we want to be a successful institution too. We want to be a successful program. So we'll be doing things like, if you're hearing this and you're in our area, Miami, you can volunteer in our prep lab. We're doing things with our digs. Like, yeah, you know, people can come and volunteer on our digs. We're even uh, working with joint programs where like for Mongolia, for instance, people can sign up and come out to Mongolia with us on a dig. That's cool. So all sorts of stuff like that. And we don't have a website for our paleontology department yet, right? Because there's no exhibit, but the website will go live when the exhibit mm -hmm. uh, opens as well. But we'll have all of that information, you know, and info on our website as well. So I, I tell people, please keep checking back. And for now, can they go to the Frost Science Museum website? Yeah, it's just frostscience.org. There's nothing on it yet about dinosaurs, mm. but there will be a paleontology <laughs> page. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. That's great. And then um, I guess if our listeners want to, you know, keep tabs on you and your work, hear about that pachycephalosaur paper and all your other stuff you've got going on. Where, <laughs> and where's that other the, top secret thing. The other top secret thing. Yeah. The, where's the best place that they can uh, find you online? Uh, best place uh, is, can we call it Twitter anymore? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm going to call it Twitter now X. It'll be something next year <laughs> uh, as it'll be a symbol. Uh, and I am at double beam. So that's what Diplodocus means. People ask me that all the time. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's Diplodocus. Uh, yeah, so at Double Beam. And then, of course, if you're looking for uh, my research papers and stuff, my Google Scholar profile. And what's really cool, too, is I try to all of my I put all of my research papers on ResearchGate as well. So nice. even if they weren't originally open access, all of my papers 
as soon as I get them, they I have put them on there, so you can read everything I've written. That's great. And yeah, then research, tell me how bad it is. <laughs> <laughs> ResearchGate seems to be like the repository for peer review, at least for paleontology. Yeah, it seems like every different field of study has their preferred one for mm -hmm. ResearchGate. So that's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This was a pleasure, and thanks for showing us around yeah. and showing us behind the scenes at the upcoming exhibits too. Absolutely. So you'll have to come back next time and then do an after. You know. Yeah. Yes. That's true. It's a before and after. It's a the before and after sign will be gone from oh. the after. <laughs> There'll be a new sign. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks again, Carrie, not only for the interview, but for showing us around the museum. We did this great tour where we started in a traveling shark exhibit, mm -hmm. which was super neat. They had all these life-size shark replicas in the room it may be even more scared to go in the ocean <laughs> because a big great white shark with its mouth open and you can see it in full scale like at face level is horrifying and they had some really cool like blown up i think they were made out of aluminum shark scales so you could feel like the texture because they're very spiky and super interesting but yeah because it's it's largely an aquarium too he told us a story about how there was a species of sea urchin which almost went extinct and they happened to have a huge collection of them in their aquarium. So they helped repopulate and it's just a really cool place. And they'll be adding more dinosaurs to it soon too. And now onto our dinosaur of the day, Hungarosaurus, which was a request from Irricator via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. Hungarosaurus was a nodosaurid and chiosaur that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Western Hungary. It looks similar to other nodosaurs if you think of dinosaurs like Boreal Pelta. It walked on all fours, low to the ground. It had a long tail, a small head. Its body was covered in armor, the osteoderms. It also had spikes on the back and around the hips. And being a nodosaur, it didn't have a club at the end of the tail. It was estimated to be up to 13 to 16 feet, or 4 to 4.8 meters long. The skull is estimated to be 12 and a half to about 14 inches or 32 to 36 centimeters long. And it's estimated to weigh between over 1,400 to over 1,500 pounds or about 650 to 688 kilograms. That's very specific. Yeah. Much smaller than, say, 74 tons. <laughs> or even an ankylosaurus. <laughs> Hungarosaurus had a slender upper arm or humerus that was long. It was about 18 inches or 45 and a half centimeters long. The type species is Hungarosaurus tormai. It was named in 2005 by Attila Osi. The genus name means Hungarian lizard. And the species name is in honor of Andras Torma, who found the fossils. And those fossils were found in 2000. Four individuals were found at first, and they were together. Oh, we've got a four theme going on in addition. <laughs> yeah. yeah, lots of four types of the same dinosaur found together at first. I can't think of any other ankylosaur where they found four of them together mm. because the conventional wisdom is that ankylosaurs were sort of loners and that's why we keep finding them isolated alone. It's really cool that they found a group of them. Yeah. And then later the fifth skeleton was found. <laughs> what? So. <laughs> well, the holotype is at in the collections now at the Hungarian Natural History Museum in Budapest, which you mentioned, Garrett, we, we were there a few years ago. Yeah, it's a, several, quite a few at this point. <laughs> quite a few. Yeah, I didn't want to do the math, but I remember liking the museum. <laughs> yes. <laughs> a lot of cool displays. Plus, I think it might be the, well, it's the only place I can think of where you can see Hungarosaurus. Yeah, I haven't seen it anywhere else that I can think of. They have 450 bones of the holotype that have been found. It includes parts of the skull and jaw, neck vertebrae, back and tail vertebrae, tendon fragments, ribs parts of the shoulder and hand, part of the pelvis, and more than 100 osteoderms. It's a lot of osteoderms. Oh, yeah. Makes sense, I guess, if your body's covered in them. Yeah, and that's just the holotype, not all four to five individuals. Yeah. And then, like I said, there was a fifth skeleton and some isolated bones later found and described, too. And those isolated bones were from the skulls of juveniles. Oh, cool. There is another notosaur, also known from Hungary. Struthiosaurus, but Hungarosaurus was found to be different from it because there's differences in the skull, and it seems that Hungarosaurus is more derived than Struthiosaurus. Farther down the family tree. Mm-hmm. 
A study in 2021 looked at the skull ornamentation of Hungarosaurus and found three different sizes, which they interpreted as representing different growth stages. They weren't allowed to do histology on the bones. Mm. There doesn't seem to be any osteoderms on the skulls. All the fossils had rough texturing on the premaxilla and nasal and a sharp crest-like ridge on the postorbital behind the eye. They found some variation that seemed to correlate with growth, like the skulls look different depending on their size and presumed age. They found that the pattern of the ornamentation also changes as Hungarosaurus got larger. The smallest premaxilla, the front of the jaw, was about half the size of the holotype, so they thought that came from a juvenile or subadult. And the smallest fossils studied had these deep, large pits and grooves as ornamentation. On the larger fossils, the ornamentation was quote-unquote slightly irregular with less pitting and it had shallow holes. So it's possible that there's some variation between the individuals, or maybe it's the way the bones fossilized, or maybe even sexual dimorphism, but that's hard to know for sure. That makes me wonder, like we were saying, how they were usually loners. If all but one of them are babies, Mm -hmm. maybe it's just a parent and it's babies. (laughs) Maybe. It's so hard to know. Or it's larger offspring, but they might be one family unit, I guess. In terms of what Hungarosaurus ate, a study in 2022 of Hungarosaurus teeth found that it probably ate soft vegetation based on tooth wear. They also compared it to Maquadon's teeth, which wore down more. And it's possible that Hungarosaurus ate flowering plants. It was an herbivore, for sure. And it was a low browser. It ate food that was about 3.3 feet or 1 meters off the ground. They estimated that it formed teeth within between 63 to 126 days, averaging 94 days. Meaning that was a continuous cycle, not when it was about 94 days old. Mm -hmm. Every 94 days it was getting new teeth. (laughs) Yes. So many new teeth. Yeah. (laughs) Hungarosaurus lived in a floodplain environment, and other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place include Pneumataraptor, a small peravian theropod, the Rhabdodontid, Maclodon, Abelosaurs, sauropods, and birds. And other animals that lived around the same time and place include fish, amphibians, crocodiliforms, turtles, and pterosaurs. And our fun fact of the day is about sauropods again. Yay! <laughs> It's that there's a group of sauropods called Flagella caudata. Oh. Which I just think is one of the most fun dinosaur group names I've heard of. That is. So this is a little bit of a fun with phylogenetics fun Ooh. fact. <laughs> that, that to me just flashed up fun with flags, Sheldon Cooper. <laughs> hey. Anyway, that's not a bad thing. I guess. We're dino nerds. We own it. Yeah. So <laughs> I mentioned diplodocoids earlier. That's the group that includes Diplodocus, Amargosaurus, Apatosaurus, like I said, Brontosaurus, if you include it, as well as the new dinosaur, Cytosaura, and many others. But a large subset of the Diplodocoids are the Flagellicaudatans. And Flagellicaudata was named in 2004 by Gerald Harris and Peter Dodson. The clade was named in the same paper that describes the sauropod Suowasia, mm. or Suowasia, I think is the correct way to pronounce it because they actually gave a pronunciation guide in that paper, which I appreciate. Nice. I don't think we've done this as a dinosaur of the day yet, but it is a really cool sauropod. You're saying you want someone to request it? Maybe. I don't know. I'm just <laughs> going to give a quick background on it since we haven't covered it. Its name basically translates to ancient thunder in crow. It was found on ancestral crow territory in North America, and ancient thunder is a reference to the thunder lizard. Ooh, brontosaurus. Yep, because brontosaurus means thunder lizard, but in Latin, maybe Greek, one of those. Brontosaurus is also a diplodocoid from the same geological formation, so it makes sense that they would reference it since they're in the same place in the same time, and they're both diplodocoids. And I think Ancient Thunder is a really cool name meaning, but when combined, Su'uwasa in Crow actually has its own meaning already Mm. put together. And it means the first thunder heard in spring. Oh, I like that. It's so poetic. I love that name. So I just think the name is a great combination of human history and scientific history. So Su'uwasa, so cool. But Su'uwasa is also cool because it has a lot of traits in common with both dicreosaurids and diplodocids, and they're all traits that were thought to be unique to those groups. 
So this showed that there was likely a common ancestor to those two groups, and it's all just showing up in Su'uwasia. Hmm. So in their analysis, Su'uwasia was outside both of the groups. It wasn't quite a Dicreosaurid or a Diplodocid, but there wasn't a good name for just where it sat in the family tree, so Harris and Dotson decided to come up with one. And it has something to do with the tail. Yep. Because <laughs> Cotta. Yep. So they came up with the name for the group, Flagella Caudata. And Flagella Caudata comes from two Latin words, flagellum, meaning whip, and cauda, meaning tail. So they're the whip tails. Mm. No offense to Carrie, but it is a better name than double beams, which is what diplodocoids <laughs> oh. are. <laughs> but it would be a fitting name for diplodocids too, because they, they have had, whip tails. They had the whip tails. But it also applies to dicreosaurids. So when you combine both the dicreosaurids and the diplodocids, they have this feature in common, and that's why they decided to name the group Flagella caudata. Of course, it's a phylogenetic clade, so it's not just a name for all the animals that have that tail whip. Officially, it's, quote, the most recent common ancestor of Dicreosaurus and Diplodocus and all of its descendants. Hmm. So if you have a family tree, you pick out Dicreosaurus and Diplodocus and trace back until the animal that they share in common, the most recent one that they share in common, that branching point on the family tree and everything around it, everything since that point, that's what Flagella caudata is. That's how all the phylogenetic names go. And it's always a mouthful describing them rather mm -hmm. than just saying they're the ones with the whip tails. But anyway, that means that Flagella caudata includes some of our favorite dinosaurs like Amargosaurus and Bahatosaurus. The ones with the huge neck spines, probably sails, mm -hmm. as well as Diplodocus and Apatosaurus. It also includes any animals that don't fit neatly into either group, like Suwasia was originally thought to. But the funny thing about this story is that a more recent analysis found that Suwasia was actually a Dicreosaurid. Oh. It wasn't outside in its own little weird flagella caudata basal position. So I think that's really interesting because there's a good chance. That if when they did their first analysis, they had determined that it was a dicreosaurid, they probably would have never even named Flagella caudata mm -hmm. because they would have just said Suwasia is a dicreosaurid and left it at that. It wouldn't have had this fun name. Yeah. They might have still named it, but there's a good chance they wouldn't have. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. Stay tuned next week. We have at least one new dinosaur to talk about. There might be more that pop up between now and then. <laughs> this one's really cool. It's not a sauropod, but it's still really cool. <laughs> <laughs> if you want even more dinosaur goodness, then head over to inodino.com. We've got our show notes and links to our sources from the episode. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.